Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask a Psychiatrist live stream. My name is Monica, and today I have the honor to chat to Dr. Bradwin about depressive disorders and what we can do to optimize our wellness. Specifically, in the first part of this live stream, we'll be answering questions that you sent in through the community and through the Discord server. Then we'll have the opportunity to talk about ways to optimize wellness using the intrinsic practice, which is a psychological literacy program that you can use to enhance your experience of happiness. So I invite you to deeply engage in our chat today by leaving your comments, thoughts, or questions in the chat box to the right or a comment below and um, enjoy. As well, I do want to remind you that because we're touching upon potentially sensitive topics to take the time you need to take care of yourself. This recording will be available for you to watch at your own convenience, so there's definitely no pressure to watch it now. Though we do welcome you to join us live if that's something you're comfortable with. So the plan for today is that I will give a brief introduction to myself, Dr. Bradwin, and then we will jump directly into the questions that you've sent in from the community, followed by the ways that you can use to optimize your wellness. As well, because I know that many of you are joining from different parts of the world at different times, I'm going to be repeating the outline periodically throughout the live stream, just so you know where we're at. And so with that, thank you so much for tuning with us today. We really appreciate it. And we hope this helps increase the accessibility to psychology and psychiatry. So my name is Monica, and I am a clinical neuroscience graduate student with a strong passion for psychiatry and outreach initiatives. Very, very grateful that I get to participate as a Psych2Go team member, where I get to talk to you, the community, and chat with experts. So with that, I'm going to give you all an introduction to our expert today, Dr. Bradwin. So welcome, Dr. Bradwin. Hi, Dr. Monica. Bradwin. Hello. Thank you for joining us. So yeah, Dr. No, Bradwin. Nice to be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Bradwin is a psychiatrist trained in medicine at the University of Sherbrooke and psychiatry at McGill University. He is a professor emeritus and ex-dean of medicine at the University of Ottawa founding dean at the Ottawa-Shanghai Joint School of Medicine, visiting professor at the Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine, and is presently a professor of psychiatry at the University of Montreal. His work has been shared in over 350 educational media interventions, and his specialties are in psychotherapy, medical education, and psychiatry. So he truly brings expert advice to today's discussion. Psych2Go hopes to host more of these educational media interventions to make psychiatry and psychology accessible to all. Welcome, Dr. Radwin. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be back. Very, very happy that you're able to be back. I'm sure a lot of people enjoyed watching our last live stream about anxiety, which you can find on our channel. So I thought, let's just begin with a question that really puts this whole live stream about depression and depressive disorders into context. And this is actually the most commonly asked question on our YouTube community. So someone has asked us to provide an overview about some of the types of depressive disorders and the common signs to look out for. Okay, so, so, so the basic question is, what is depression? I think it's a good... Uh, Good first question. Uh, so uh, depression uh, simply is uh, when uh, generally we feel uh, low, everything is slow, everything is dark, uh, everything is hard. So uh, at the level of our body, we may uh, not have much energy. 
we may not have uh, much appetite, we can't sleep uh, much, we may have also lots of uh, aches and pains. And then emotionally, either it's empty, we feel empty, we feel sad, uh, we may feel a lot of uh, guilt and some uh, irritability. In terms of our thoughts, uh, sometimes we have difficulty concentrating, uh, keeping attention, we think slow, and often uh, we think in a very pessimistic uh, way, uh, even thinking that life is not worth it and thinking of hurting uh, oneself and so on. And also behaviorally, we tend to isolate. We tend to not feel to do things, not want to do things, not meet people, uh, isolate. And generally, our self-esteem is uh, low. Uh, we don't feel very good. So overall, that is depression. Uh, it's also called uh, major depression, major depressive uh, disorder. It depends uh, what uh, the uh, diagnostic uh, systems that are used, but basically that's, that's depression. So, so that's the experience of depression. And then there are different types of depression. So some that are just uh, come, went, and go. So it's a major depression, uh, one episode. Uh, there are uh, some depression that tend to come back. So meaning that they last a few months, they're very painful, but things get better, things get normal. And then maybe a few months later, a few years later, another, another experience of depression. So these may be called recurrent recurrent depression, so meaning that they come back uh, often. There's also a type of depression which is uh, similar to major depression, but not that intense, but always there. So it's a depression that is uh, milder, always there, and so sometimes it's called uh, dysthymia or persistent depressive disorder. So it's not like a down and then back up and normal again. It's always a bit down, you know, always a bit uh, having to push oneself to feel good. Uh, so it's always there. So it's a persistent type of depression. And then uh, another type, uh, which is very important to see the difference, is that uh, a, a combination of major depression, so when everything is uh, low, dark, slow, but then with episodes, that everything is the opposite. Everything is high, everything is uh, bright, everything is good. Uh, so for example, the opposite of being tired, lots of energy, the opposite of being sad, or being euphoric, uh, feeling on top of the world. The mind goes very, very, very quick, uh, doing a lot of things, uh, often uh, socializing a lot, spending a lot of money. That's called hypomania or mania. And in combination with major depression, the low and the high, it's when you hear about bipolar disorder, basically bipolar disorder. It's a bit of a different uh, type. Oh, wow. That's really useful to know. Um, I think a nice follow-up question is that once people notice these signs of having trouble sleeping, low mood, and things that are typically associated with depression, how would you recommend someone to prevent this from spiraling or getting any worse? Yes, well, the, the usual is to uh, seek professional help to at least get a good evaluation to make sure that uh, it is depression and to understand uh, how it uh, became depression. Why? Why? You know, in myself, why am I depressed? Uh, so then with a good evaluation, it's possible to determine, uh, you know, do I have a family history? You know, does depression run in the family? Or is it a depression plus bipolar illness? That's important to know. So is it also uh, because of, of uh, some of uh, my uh, psychological habits? You know, does that contribute to it? Uh, do, do I have, a, have I tended to isolate myself? That would contribute to it. So a good evaluation would determine uh, partly the cause, so the biological cause, the psychological cause, and the social cause and confirm the diagnosis. Uh, so that's the first thing to do. So then based on that, a good uh, treatment plan can be uh, devised. Because a good treatment plan, and there are very good treatments, uh, many work very well, but it has to be well, well uh, tailored, tailored to each individual. So that's why a good evaluation is the key uh, to get a good treatment plan. 
Right. And for those looking to seek that professional treatment plan, who do they typically go to? Are they therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists? Do you mind breaking that down a little further for our younger audience members who may not know? Yes. Well, at first, uh, it may be uh, any uh, primary care professional, often family physician, or sometime at school. It, it could be health services, student services uh, for to uh, get that first uh, evaluation. And based on that, then it could be more access uh, to either a psychologist, uh, if the main treatment will be psychological. Uh, it could be also the family physician with a psychologist, if there needs to be medication, uh, if there needs to, in addition to psychological treatment. Sometimes uh, the uh, diagnosis is not clear, or treatment uh, has been uh, suggested but doesn't work quite as well as expected. So there may be a need for a uh, consultation with uh, an evaluation with a psychiatrist. Uh, so, so go deeper uh, into uh, what may be the diagnosis, the causes, and uh, more suggestion for, uh, for treatment. So it's really, it's a continuum. But first, you know, reach out is to reach out uh, if it's a school student services, uh, primary care system, uh, some mental health uh, uh, community uh, centers, uh, depending also where one lives and how care is organized. But it's to reach out and then uh, eventually, you know, th there can be access to uh, the proper help uh, and eventually more specialized help if necessary. Great. That's very. It is another point too uh, that you know if one feels so bad uh, that uh, everything is so dark, everything is so painful uh, that life doesn't even feel worth it anymore, and having uh, you know ideas of death, ideas of hurting uh, oneself, uh, ideas of suicide, then any emergency room or, or so in some places there are some uh, uh, crisis lines uh, by phone, but that can be. Uh, reach uh, sometimes there's a system of with a mobile crisis team uh, or the emergency room because then uh, there could be right away a good evaluation and a good access access to uh, services uh, because it's serious it's serious you know it's like having any other medical problem uh, that may be very intense very acute uh, have to get the care right away yeah, it's very good to speak to the importance of reaching out as soon as one notices some signs that become, that can become quite distressing. Um, but I do know that many people who commented uh, in the community said that it's quite difficult to get that courage or even have that access to care. And so what are your um, thoughts yes, or advice you, for that, for people who yes, can you're, you're, not necessarily reach out? Yes, well, you're, you're, you're quite right because part of uh, the experience of depression is losing hope, right? Feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, uh, feeling that things won't, won't work out, uh, not having trust, uh, uh, and not having much energy sometimes to, to do things. So it's very hard to reach out, but that's at a time where you know, at minimum call, uh, call a friend, uh, call a family member. Uh, if uh, your student, uh, you know, just uh, go to the uh, school health center uh, or, or sometime to employee health, uh, reach out, reach out. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I know it's hard, uh, but that effort is, is really necessary because, you know, there's no hope when we're depressed. So we don't even think about things that may be able to get better, that there are some good treatments, that things could go well. Uh, there's a loss of perspective, you know, that things were well and they get well again uh, because the, it's the moment and it's painful and it's dark. So it's to have a bit uh, of uh, hope, have a bit of trust and uh, reach out, reach out. For sure. Yeah, hope is a really, really big part of it. And on that topic of kind of factors that can improve depressive symptoms or factors that can hurt it. Would you like to talk about the kind of beneficial things to do or, or personality or like attitudes to have versus the not so beneficial ones that can extend the experience of depression? Yes, so uh, during a depression, so we're talking more about treatment, right? Treatment because it's, 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 it's uh, serious. 
it's painful and something needs to be done. So in the same way that we may uh, understand depression and the various subtypes of depressions as a biopsychosocial you know, suffering issue, right? Uh, there may be some biology, the way our body functions, our brain, uh, there may be some genetics, uh, uh, some psychological uh, uh, ways uh, that we have that uh, may not be very conducive to feeling well and social isolation, then the help is also along the biopsychosocial uh, dimension. So what does bio mean? Sometimes it means a bit of behavioral activation to do a bit, to start to do a bit, even if uh, it's walking a bit, is uh, even though it's very difficult, but to, to be a bit active, uh, eat well, avoid as much as possible substances, alcohol, because it can worsen uh, you know, problems of depression and medication may be necessary. So there are many different types of medication that can uh, help uh, a lot so that's you can see the biological uh, aspect of it psychologically uh, they are uh, therapies that have been uh, shown to work very well to uh, to be uh, efficacious so we, we talk about uh, cognitive behavior therapy for depression that can work very well so modifying thoughts the dark thoughts but also some of the behavior and also the, the emotions uh, so cognitive behavior therapy or CBT. Uh, there's a form also of uh, therapy uh, that is based on uh, life transitions and uh, relationships called uh, interpersonal therapy, IPT. This is also a very good technique. Uh, there are There is some uh, what we call biological uh, activation. So there are many tools, there are many tools that can be uh, useful to really get out of, uh, of the depression. The social aspect of it, you know, biopsychosocial, the social aspect of it is very important because when we uh, suffer from uh, depression, or even from anxiety, there's a tendency to do less socially. There's a tendency to isolate and have less social contacts. So that in itself becomes a problem because it's like a deprivation. So it causes uh, harm to be alone and not to uh, connect with uh, people we like and people we, uh, we uh, feel good with. Uh, so that uh, social isolation has to be reversed in a sense, to reach out, to do more. That's part of the treatment. That's part of the treatment because you know, social contacts, social activities, uh, network, uh, it uh, not only feeds you know, wellness, but it can also help during uh, recovery, biopsychosocial. So the whole thing, uh, it's a whole package really of interventions that, that can be uh, used and done to get out of depression. Yeah, that's definitely very good to know the, the vast array of tools that are available. And on that topic of treatments, are there any specific kinds or like combinations that typically you would recommend someone to seek out or do you think that people should just be open to whichever their practitioner recommends? Well, to, to be uh, open to uh, whatever the science has shown, whatever we know uh, works. Uh, many clinicians such as myself uh, see uh, the beneficial effects of uh, treatments, especially a uh, well-tailored uh, complete treatment with biopsychosocial. Uh, they work, they do, they do work. Uh, so uh, when that is recommended to you know, to trust to try uh, medication treatment, you know there are many medications that can work well. Uh, the key is to choose them well. The first uh, medication to adjust medication well, uh, to set the goals uh, and combine it with psychological tools. So sometimes the combination and depends on the people uh, on the person's uh, wishes. Uh, sometimes it can be a combined treatment. So person says, yeah, I'm depressed. Uh, I don't mind taking medication. Uh, I want to get out of, uh, I, I suffer so much. Uh, I'll take medication. Uh, and I also want to, uh, to uh, try the psychological tools that you may offer to me and I'll do my best. So I'll take the whole package, right? And then, so it's like a combined treatment. Sometimes pe people prefer to start with medication. Uh, and after that, maybe use more of the psychological tools. They'd rather take the take a medication and wait for things to, be, to get better. So it's more sequential or the other way around. I'll start with uh, depending on the 
urgency and uh, how deep the depression is. Some people will say, I'll try without medication, like cognitive behavior therapy or interpersonal therapy, for example. And that may be sufficient, that may work. Uh, but if it's not, then medication can be added. So it's sequential, you know, one uh, after the other. Uh, so yes, so to trust, uh, to believe, uh, because, uh, you know, trusting and believing and trying, you know, gives a good chance of getting well, because these treatments uh, can work, can work very well. Great. And when you say work, do you think someone can expect for their depression to fully go away or for them to just expect a reduction in their symptoms so that they are now functional? What kind of um, outcome are we kind of? Yes. So about? it all depends on the person. It all depends on how many, dep how many uh, depressions. Uh, so if it's recurrent and uh, uh, how life habits were. But, but, uh, setting goals is very important and so there's the goal of betterness i want to get better so less symptom less sadness uh, better sleep uh, eating better having more energy uh, that's good that's good is to come out of the depression but it's also always good to say you know i would like to go beyond betterness i would like to be at wellness and that's a, then at this point it's more uh, you know i, I want to be well and what can i do in the way I think, in the way I feel, uh, in my relationships, in my life, what can I do to uh, not only get well, but stay well? So that's when uh, any good mental health uh, practice, uh, whichever you like, right? Uh, it is good to uh, uh, stay out, not only stay out of depression, but continue to, uh, to be well. So goals are very important. Uh, at first, it may be betterness you know but at some point uh, one has to decide for oneself uh, do i really want uh, wellness and, and what do i want to what am i willing to do right to uh, to stay well because at first it's hard it takes effort uh, it takes some discipline but as things get better then it's uh, simpler to uh, organize one's life when we're being uh, uh, as a path of wellness, as a uh, path of a good mental health wellness through good practices, uh, psychological practices, a good, uh, good diet, a good uh, exercise, uh, doing a bit of mind-body uh, exercises, there are many there. Uh, so that, that maintains wellness. That's awesome to know. Um, just for those joining us today, or just joined us, because I see a couple of people have just joined. Um, we are doing a live stream. My name is Monica and I'm joined um, with Dr. Bradwin to talk about depressive disorders and ways to maintain wellness. And on the topic that we were just discussing, we'll be talking about ways to optimize and enhance one's experience of happiness later on the stream. So make sure you stay tuned and listen to that. Um, so now we've already just covered the general kind of basic understanding of depression, depressive disorders, and I thought it might be a good opportunity to answer some more specific questions that the community has asked. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds very good. Awesome. So a user by the name of Yellow Mellow on YouTube has asked, why can a person experience feelings of being depressed when there is no obvious reason for it? In other words, it just seems to come on suddenly without an obvious explanation, making it harder to really identify a root cause. Yes, because, uh, and again, the uh, concept of biopsychosocial you know, uh, can be useful because uh, one uh, may um, you know, have a nice personality, grew up in a nice family, uh, having a, a good childhood uh, and, and things coming uh, easy, good environment, but feel depressed. Why? Because, you know, there, there can be a predisposition or it can be a biological uh, vulnerability or sensitivity uh, that can lead to depression with no obvious, obvious uh, causes or triggers or traumas uh, and so on. It can be uh, biological, like anything in the body including the brain, you know, can at some point not function well. So it could be the lungs, it could be, uh, you know, the pancreas and so on and so forth. And uh, it just, 
it, it, there could be a biological uh, predisposition. Often we see uh, when we do a good uh, careful evaluation, good background, that depression runs in the family, on both sides of the family. So it could be some genetic vulnerability and predisposition, and then can lead to, uh, to depression. And obviously, if on top of that, there may be a, a difficult childhood, there could be a difficult circumstances, uh, poor lifestyle, uh, use of too much alcohol, substances, then it can make that biological uh, predisposition of vulnerability worse. But uh, a person can lead a very good and, and a healthy life and still uh, get into episodes of depression. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, you mentioned the biological component, and while interacting with the Psych2Go community, I noticed many of uh, many of the users were curious as to know what exactly are these biological components. Would you like to go into perhaps a little more um, depth? depth yes, yes, yes. So, 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 so basically, uh, is uh, regions of the brain. Uh, so the like the emotional region of the brain, uh, even the more thinking region of the brain, but also the uh, what we call uh, the regular function region of the brain. Uh, so that body energy, uh, sleep regulation, uh, appetite, and so on, they can be a dysregulation. It can just not work uh, as well. Uh, there are you know many uh, hypotheses and and some scientific evidence that uh, in these regions. Uh, and we speak, it's very complex. The brain is extremely complex. So, uh, but they are uh, what we call uh, neurotransmitter networks, right? The way they, uh, they, uh, they, they work together at uh, this function and then can lead to these uh, low mood, dark mood and thoughts and so on. Uh, you know, what are neurotransmitters? Well, the way the brain functions, you know, roughly, is that uh, there are millions of nerves that uh, communicate with each other. So, and that's how we, we, uh, we live. That's what we live uh, with, uh, what we experience, uh, what we see, what we think, how we move and everything. The nerves communicate to another nerve, often by releasing a uh, substance, natural substance, uh, that activates or inhibits the next nerve. So that these are neurotransmitters. Uh, and in depression, uh, it is uh, postulated that some of the system are not as well balanced. It's not just one neurotransmitter or two or three. It's it's many of them, but it has to do with the whole fine tuning uh, of uh, the system. It doesn't work uh, as well uh, and leads to uh, some symptoms or manifestation. It can be depression. It can be uh, uh, anxiety disorders, as we have spoken about uh, during the last uh, uh, event together. Uh, so this can be a dysregulation. And the treatments biologically uh, tend to act on uh, these uh, neurotransmitters and the nerves and rebalance and rebalance uh, them. So that's why we speak about uh, uh, medications that may act a bit more on serotonin, no adrenaline, no adrenaline, dopamine, and so on. Uh, it's, it's very complex. It's just to simplify, they do work. So they do work, uh, and they have actions in these. Uh, areas of the brain uh, to uh, these uh, neurotransmitter system. We also know from doing, for example, uh, imaging studies, right? So being able to uh, see the brain, but also see the activity of, uh, of the brain. And so we, that before and after treatment, there can be changes in these regions of, uh, of the brain. And what's interesting uh, about uh, treatments that work well uh, in people who have uh, depression, so, for example, medication treatment, psychotherapy treatment, right? Uh, when uh, a person gets better, either from uh, using medication or psychotherapy, and uh, there is a study done before and after treatment. So, before the treatment works, look at the brain activity, you know, uh, and the regions, and remeasuring after they are well through treatment. There are changes. The brain is different. But what's also interesting is that uh, quite often the changes uh, that are uh, activated by medication are different than the changes that are activated by psychotherapy. So that's why sometimes a combination 
is best because they don't do exactly the same thing at the same place in the brain. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've always been quite interested to learn about the biological basis of how that works. But since we have a lot of questions about social aspects of it, I think we'll talk, we'll save that, we'll put a pin on that, and then we'll talk about the social aspects. Um, so for instance, Rochelle from YouTube has asked, how does one deal with depression if they're living in a highly stressful, fast-paced environment when there is really no time to rest? So really tackling the social aspect of the biopsychosocial model. Yes, well, so... Uh... The this, this, yeah, yeah. There's several aspects uh, to that. Uh, one, during a depression, uh, it's hard to cope. You know, it's hard to cope with uh, uh, life demands. Sometimes the life is very demanding, but we're well and we cope with it and we like it and we do well. During a depression, it's hard, and sometimes you know the uh, environment is difficult, the work environment is difficult, the school environment or life in general is uh, difficult. So that's even harder, you know, during uh, during a depression. Uh, but there's also uh, how we uh, see things, how we react to things, uh, how we give interpretation to what happens uh, to us. Uh, and that's when uh, the notion of the locus of control can be very uh, important, uh, which means that some people tend to react a lot you know, from the environment. You know, they're more you know, outside in type of uh, people. And so they tend to be more affected by, by what's difficult in the environment. Uh, other people uh, tend or, or, or learn to uh, uh, be more anchored uh, into themselves and into uh, calmness or into confidence, and they act more on life. So they don't react as much. They don't, they're not as sensitive uh, to things that may be difficult. Uh, and learning how to be more from an internal locus of control, so the power inside, I use it, and I live from the inside out can help a lot in general and help a lot during uh, depression, but can also help a lot in not getting uh, depressed. There's also the uh, what we call the uh, thinking mediation. When something happens or the way we look at the, uh, at the world, the world uh, being uh, more pessimistic, uh, coming to conclusion that things are, will not go well, uh, are not well, losing perspective uh, in time or in space and only seeing the bad thing and not being able to see uh, the rest of it. So it's a way of uh, understanding and processing. Uh, so it's, uh, these are cognitive processes, uh, negative cognitive sets, we can say, that can uh, influence you know, and more and more the, the, the emotions and lead to depression uh, and uh, make it uh, worse. There's also a, a certain type of emotionality. If we uh, uh, tend to uh, be sad and angry and uh, react a lot from anger rather than to learn to uh, be more calm and uh, also optimistic or use a bit of courage, uh, you know, the negative emotions uh, are experienced during a depression, but negative emotions themselves can maintain or worsen uh, depression. So that's the emotional aspect. Then there's the interpersonal aspect and uh, what uh, like we were saying earlier is that uh, during depression we isolate if there's stress we might isolate uh, not contact friends or family and then s suffer from that isolation and that that reinforces depression even contributes uh, to it so one of the ways out is to reach out uh, connect with people continue to connect uh, more people uh, uh, who we trust uh, and uh, we feel good with uh, and sometimes the techniques of uh, interpersonal psychotherapy is to uh, make these relationships uh, better more conducive to uh, feeling uh, well uh, and so so these are all the uh, approaches in a sense to feeling better. That's awesome. I think especially these days where isolation is unfortunately quite, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately quite prominent due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it has become more and more difficult to reach out and gain that in-person contact. So do you have any advice for being able to stay connected for those who don't really feel as connected through the screen, for example, because I know it's a quite common experience among students. 
Yes, yes, and it's been uh, especially hard, uh, and it's still hard now uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but but uh, even through the screen, uh, that's better than uh, not being connected at all. Uh, simple walks, getting out of the apartment, getting out of home, and uh, you know, meet people on the way. And uh, now there's uh, more and more possibilities to go back to cafe and and uh, have some uh, activities outside. This is very important. This is very important. Some people during the pandemic have uh, taken the opportunity to reach out to cousins that they like, that they, have, you know, they don't have mm-hmm. much chance to uh, see because when things were very busy, they never, uh, so to family, you know, to do uh, family reunions, uh, friends, uh, uh, because we have at least some tools to connect virtually, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, something, uh, it's important. Uh, you know, joining uh, groups sometimes, activities, uh, especially as uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, it, things uh, open up. Uh, but sometimes when there is a reach out for help, right, uh, part of the help uh, will be uh, some group activities. So because the psychotherapy could also be uh, in a group psychotherapy, group CBT, for example, uh, that can be helpful. But uh, good social contact, more social contacts, uh, that will help during a depression. And because during a depression, we do less, we see less people, we're less connected. And that in, its, in itself becomes a problem, contributes to the depression because it's a deprivation in a sense uh, of social contacts. Yeah, that's very good to reinforce the main idea that any contact, even through the screen, is better than just kind of yeah. closing closing in on oneself, I think. Yes, I think yes. That being the message. And yeah, so that is essentially one of the main three questions that we've received from the community about depression, um, really focused on one's own experience. We also have questions that were focused more on how a person can help their friend, for instance. So um, before we go into those, I just wanted to give another um, recap of what we've covered for those that just joined in. Um, So we've talked about depression overall. We've covered questions about that. Then we talked about more specific questions sent from the community about the experience of depression. We are going to then talk about the ways that one can support a friend or a family member for who's experienced depression. And then finally, we're going to talk about ways to optimize wellness and questions sent in from the chat. So if you haven't gotten the chance, be sure to send questions in the chat and we will get to it. So with regards to social support, Jax from YouTube has asked, social support is very important, but how do you help someone that's going through depression, but their attitude is unhealthy for those around them? Yes, so uh, first is to understand, we spoke about the the symptoms and manifestation of major depression to understand what it is. Uh, And uh, if you suspect that uh, your friend or family member may be uh, experiencing uh, depression, well, it's again to reach out, not to uh, be uh, too pushy in a sense, uh, but just to reach out to see what the, what the problem uh, may be, ask uh, how one can help, uh, uh, try maybe to uh, encourage more connection. Uh, but then it comes at some point where, you know, it could be uh, serious, and it could be uh, urgent, so especially if there's uh, talks about uh, you know, not uh, enjoying life, uh, thinking about dying, uh, even talking about suicide, uh, then as much as possible to encourage to seek out for help. Uh, Sometimes it's necessary to uh, uh, you know, take the measures to make sure that uh, they just access to help, going to an emergency room and going with that person uh, and a friend with, uh, to an emergency room, encouraging and even going. Uh, physically and, and helping uh, because it can be very, very serious, you know, uh, the uh, thoughts, of, thoughts of suicide. But otherwise, is to uh, try to be there, try to support, and uh, also encourage seeking for uh, help. You know, uh, giving example of maybe you know somebody who's uh, who went through a rough time or yourself uh, and uh, did get help and it was uh, it was good, it was helpful. Uh, point out where help may be. Uh, available uh, and encouraging, uh, staying in contact, in contact, because uh, isolation is the worst. 
Yeah, I think providing that kind of personal anecdote or the anecdote of a friend, if they have permission to do so, can be really helpful to encourage a friend or family member to reach out for sure. Yes, and sometimes doing a bit of uh, uh, the uh, inf information gathering of where help could be. You know, that could be simple uh, and suggest you know, that there are ways and here are the phone numbers or the addresses uh, or where when you could reach out, uh, you know, it would be a good thing. Uh, uh, again, give examples of uh, how others have done that uh, and we're glad afterward, we're glad to have done that, to have reached out. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely also be including some resources and links after in the comment section um, for those who are seeking resources. But I also wanted to know, do you have any recommendations of reliable sources for people to seek out to learn more or to get help? Yeah, well, it depends where one lives. Uh, in uh, many jurisdictions, uh, there are access points. So some uh, even uh, official government uh, you know, websites that say, you know, if uh, you're in crisis, uh, call 811. Or there may be a crisis line, uh, or there may be a crisis line, a crisis team to uh, to help out where the emergency rooms may be. Reach out to a family physician, walk-in clinics, uh, any of that, any of that. Uh, you know, it's uh, often uh, as simple as you know, googling. Uh, I live in such city. You know, services for depression, uh, suicide prevention, uh, anything, anything, uh, and that can lead to. Uh, the organized healthcare system, and in some places quite well organized, uh, depending on the, on the city and the uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so that's that's the first you know first thing to do. Logistically, it could be quite difficult for minors like to kind of reach out right without parental permission and under very difficult circumstances where their parents might not be supportive or um, validating their feelings of depression what kind of well yeah that's what that's when that's yeah. at school that's when at school uh, often they are uh there may be a psychologist nurse or just a service at school tell the teacher in many places there's been a lot of uh, sensitization uh and uh, information about uh, mental health and mental health problem uh, tell a teacher uh tell a friend uh and who uh, who uh, may be able to uh, to help uh so that would be you know the way to do it of course, you know, walking into an emergency room, you know, that's uh, possible. It's not often uh, that feasible for a young person. So it's basically teacher, friends, uh, if parents uh, are not uh, sensitive enough to understand or uh, may not uh, uh, quite know what to do, uh, uh, reach out at school. That's, that's uh, it's often, often a, a first good way of uh, accessing help. Yeah, thank you. I think this leads in quite well to the idea of using the resources you can, whether that's online or your friends, or your family, to promote wellness. So I do want to shift this conversation uh, to questions that we've received from the community and then eventually the intrinsic practice on what one can do to really promote that experience of happiness. And so the first question that we received is that what apart from things like you mentioned cbt medications what are some complementary medicine techniques um, for treating or maintaining wellness yes and uh, so uh, complementary medicine uh, they they are some uh, we call mind body approaches but there's also uh, some um, pharmacological agents. So, for example, there are some uh, herbal uh, like compounds uh, that, like hypericum, that may be uh, useful. Uh, but they tend to be useful uh, in uh, mild to moderate depression. Uh, a a mind-body practices can uh, help, especially uh, when uh, it's a, a complement to treatment or. You know, when we don't feel so good, but it's not so uh, so intense. Uh, so we talk about even yoga, uh, qigong, tai chi. Uh, some acupuncture has been shown to uh, have efficacy in uh, depression. It was studied. It was studied. 
so all of these approaches uh, can be useful, but it comes to a point uh, uh, that even if these approaches are used, uh, and especially if depression is uh, more than mild but moderate to severe, then uh, the uh, medication combination with uh, techniques like such as uh, cognitive behavior therapy or interpersonal therapy uh, should be considered. Uh, we did some studies, for example, with the use of uh, mindfulness, right, uh, in uh, different uh, conditions. Uh, it can help, but uh, typically it's not as effective uh, as uh, cognitive behavior therapy, for example. Uh, so it can be helpful, but not would not be a first line uh, treatment. Uh, other things that are important is uh, what we call behavioral activation. Simple things such as uh, trying to get up in the morning, uh, walk, do a bit of exercise, uh, especially early in the morning. Uh, so for some people, a little bit of running can be good for mood and can, can help. I know it takes a lot of effort, uh, but these simple uh, activities, especially early in the morning, tends to activate and help uh, in um, resynchronizing uh, the uh, day-night function. Because uh, during a depression, it can be a uh, desynchronization of uh, when we feel like uh, falling asleep and when we get up. Uh, and so it, 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 there is a desynchronization with the natural rhythm uh, of day and night. So having a bit of activity in the morning, uh, some uh, uh, some exercise uh, can help to uh, uh, resynchronize and eventually get back into uh, uh, a better rhythm and also better mood. Yeah, so I think the key point just really to stay active even when it becomes quite difficult because I know a ca uh, cardinal or common symptom of depression is like anhedonia, right? So there's less will it le there's less pleasure right. in like day-to-day -day activities right. and so it becomes really hard and then it kind of I think is a reinforcing cycle almost if they don't want to go out or walk, take a walk or um, do simple things. And then it kind of perpetuates that, that cycle right, of yeah. just, you know. Um, right. Yeah. And so on that topic of promoting wellness, a person, Eliana from Discord has asked about how can you kind of boost one's self-esteem, self-confidence, self-worth to maintain wellness? Yes, so uh, that, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, and, and it's part of self-knowledge and, in a sense, self-work. Uh, so what does self-knowledge mean? Well, self-knowledge means knowing ourselves uh, and the way our body functions, our body sensations. It involves also knowing what emotions are, the difference between uh, negative and positive emotions and how to cultivate more the positive emotions and let go of the negative ones. It involves uh, knowing uh, how to think, how to think uh, logically, how to think uh, in a balanced way, uh, optimistically, with perspective. Uh, uh, so it involves doing mo more things rather than avoiding and isolating. And then they are also what we call uh, self-concepts. So what is a self-concept? Self-concept is uh, like a hypothesis or an idea about ourselves about how good we may be, about how bad we may be, about how complete, incomplete. Uh, so it could be, you know, uh, I'm not worth of uh, affection. I'm not uh, worthy of uh, love. Uh, I'm inferior. I'm incomplete. Uh, uh, I, I don't have security. So these uh, are what we call notions or self-concept. Uh, and uh, through some work, these can be understood because often, they are like programs that uh, work automatically in the background, being unconscious, but can uh, determine our experience of life uh, in relationships, in what we do, and the way we uh, we uh, see the world and see ourselves. And it, it can be quite, quite, quite uh, diminishing or inhibitory and can lead to depression or to nervousness. So understanding uh, ourselves at all, all these levels uh, and understanding the uh, self-concept, self-hypothesis, uh, we can then modify them. We can modify them uh, to uh, some affirmation, to uh, uh, acting differently in situations, uh, to questioning uh, ourselves and 
adopting a better self-concept, it is doable. So that's part of a therapy also. Yeah, I really like the idea of making a hypothesis of oneself, preferably to um, test whether, you know, to affirm one's hopefully uh, self-esteem and improve that aspect. Yeah, and some simple tools, maybe also starting with sentences, you know, I am or I am not, right? Uh, so you, So it could be I am worthy, you know, or I am unworthy. Or I will feel love if I do this, right? Uh, so that that uh, starts to uh, with the simple sentence, we start to see how we really operate, and whether uh, we may see ourselves uh, lower than what we are. Uh, because very simply, you know, uh, all of us human beings you know, at birth, uh, we are a full human being in the sense we're complete, and we uh, we have all the potential. Uh, to uh, be a, uh, a full, well-functioning and happy human being. So uh, we are all equal on that sense. However, we may not uh, learn uh, uh, to recognize who we are, recognize our what we call assets, our qualities, our talents and everything. We may not learn because parents may not show us uh, or we, we don't learn, uh, right? So we don't often do not see how we use our potential and develop develop some ideas of ourselves which is lower than what we are right so uh, i'm not intelligent or I, I, i'm not uh, good enough uh, i'm incomplete uh, something's missing uh, i'm an aberration these are some of the self concepts that can uh, can be uh, and often unconsciously uh, operational uh, and lead our life so these when we understand them and we see them, then we can start to formulate other concepts and live by them. It's not easy. It's not simple. It means uh, some effort at first and determination, but there are tools for that. But the whole, uh, uh, one of the goals of the intrinsic practice is to provide tools that can be tried uh, on one's own to modify you know, self-concept, emotions, thoughts, and so on and so forth. Yes, that is amazing. I do want to highlight for all our viewers that just joined in the toolkit, psycho, um, the toolkit, the intrinsic practice, a psychological wellness program, literacy program toolkit, where one can explore the page to enhance one's ability to experience happiness. Um, the links are in the description box below of the live stream. So please take a look after. We'll also get a few moments to chat about it. Um, after we answer some of the questions that we just got in from the live stream. So uh, these questions are, first is from Justin Adam, who asked, is mental health openly talked about among young people in Canada? I know in other countries like Japan, India, and Indonesia, it may be more stigmatized. Yes, yes, it, that's true. it depends on the, on the country. Uh, and it depends uh, on uh, also uh, the uh, the culture, the culture and how it has evolved in terms of openness and uh, knowledge on on, on the mental health. In Canada, for example, there's more and more knowledge about mental health, uh, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, and, and others. Uh, there is more and more also uh, self disclosure of uh, people who are well known. Uh, artists uh, and uh, even politicians uh, and their experiences uh, through uh, problems such as uh, depression. There are also some youth organizations, uh, peer-to-peer uh, support. Uh, there are some groups like YouthNet, which are really suicide intervention and help uh, by uh, young uh, people who, uh, who uh, do peer support, sensitization, uh, and more and more uh, acceptance uh, that uh, you know depression is a problem, it's a human problem uh, that is important, like any other problem uh, may be important. So there is less and less stigma. But it's true. It is true that uh, it varies uh, from one culture to another. Uh, recently, uh, I've done work in uh, in China in Shanghai, uh, and we see there that the government. Uh, uh, makes uh, mental health problems as an important problem. So it's part of the five-year plan. So there's more and more sensitization to the need to uh, have uh, support and intervene 
and have uh, also good primary care systems to address uh, some of the mental health uh, needs uh, in that country, in that culture. So uh, more, most countries are going more and more towards uh, openness and less uh, stigma, less of a negative uh, uh, perception of uh, mental uh, uh, illness, uh, mental health problems. So it's, 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 getting, it's getting there, but it's important to uh, uh, do more activities like we do to make it simple and make it acceptable and uh, you know, do away with the stigma. Thank you for the, answering that question. We've actually just got a bunch in right now, so we'll keep the, the rest pretty brief, but um, hopefully comprehensive. Jazz Scorpi has asked, so uh, do you recommend to kind of force yourself to do activities even when you don't want to in a depressive episode? Well, forcing is a big word because, uh, you know, it's hard to do activities when we're depressed, but starting to do a bit more, a bit more every day, understanding uh, that uh, some activities, moving, something every day, going out, uh, even walking, uh, connecting. So that's called uh, you know, some behavioral activation. Uh, yes, will be useful. Uh, but it's more important to do it stepwise in a gentle fashion uh, than just uh, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing because that would put too much uh, stress. But you know, planning in the morning, I do a bit of five minutes of stretching. I try to go out, I try to walk, I try to walk, I try to connect, uh, do it gently and add more and more and more, yes. Because you want to activate, it's also good for uh, the brain uh, to, be, uh, to be activated, the body, uh, but also connecting, right? So two activities, going out, speaking to people, seeing people, walking around, for example, uh, that, is, uh, that can be uh, helpful. So understanding that it will be helpful and add a bit more every day or every week and do more. Awesome. So one final question from the community, um, live chat that is, uh, is from Ahmed who has asked that they stopped their medication and they're starting to get some side effects. So why is it that their medication stopped working after it worked in the original? Um, and why did it get better after they stopped medication even though they should have stayed depressed. That is their question. Yes, yeah, um, so uh, it's hard to answer a question just uh, uh, globally like this, but uh, medication uh, uh, can be very useful. Uh, it has to be well uh, tailored and well adjusted. And uh, sometimes you know, there are, are, it has to be the right fit also. That's why there are many medications and then you know, being systematic about using them uh, is important. Uh, but if it's medication uh, for a one episode of depression, right, usually it's recommended to take medication once uh, one is well for about nine months to uh, one year. If it's uh, for recurrent episodes of depression, meaning somebody has experienced one, two, three episodes, uh, then medication may be needed uh, on the long uh, on the long run. So, so then it's a question of uh, you know choosing the the good the right medication at the right dose and uh, adjusting it uh, according to tolerance or side effects. Maybe shifting to another one if it's not the uh, the good balance between the good effect and uh, the side effects. Other rules that quite often it's good to start low go slow. I mean, at low dose, but know that there's going to be a dose range to reach, uh, to feel, to have more chance uh, to feel well, to the medication to its maximum uh, effect. Any decrease of medication, even if antidepressants are not medication that you, you get a huge withdrawal from, uh, when uh, the, when considering stopping medication, let's say after nine months or a year, always do it very slowly, very gradually. So even you know, uh, one, every two weeks, uh, increasing the dose a bit, and even if it's done over a few months, uh, uh, slower is better to decrease medication antidepressants. Thank you for answering the questions that were sent in from the live chat. And thank you so much for answer, uh, for asking those questions. With that, I really wanted to finally shift to our last part of the live stream, focusing on the value that the intrinsic practice can bring to enhance your experience of happiness. So just as a recap, for those that just joined us, we talked about 
questions regarding depression in general, more specific experiences of depression within oneself, what you can do to help others. Then we talked about questions that were sent in to the live chat as this stream was happening. I just also wanted to remind everyone that this will be available after our stream so you can watch it at any time at your convenience. And with that, let's talk a little bit about the intrinsic practice, which viewers can find linked in the description box below. Be sure to visit theintrinsicpractice.com, um, follow them on LinkedIn, Instagram, all the links are below. So would you like to tell us about the intrinsic practice and some of the steps that one can take to start this program and what can they expect? Yes, with pleasure. So the intrinsic practice is an uh, online uh, program that is uh, free, so it's public service uh, type of program, uh, free, freely accessible. Uh, it's basically a program or like a course uh, to uh, feel uh, well, to be well, and to feel uh, better uh, in terms of one's mental health. It is not a treatment. It's not a treatment, so it's not a treatment for depression. Uh, but uh, originally, uh, the intent uh, to develop it uh, was to uh, help uh, people who had gone through depression felt uh, better in a sense they had no more of the symptoms, uh, but wanted, wanted to uh, think more about uh, not treatment, but we wellness and maintenance of wellness. So we thought, you know, uh, let's now give up the medical model, which treats illness and symptoms, and let's get more into a wellness uh, model, so, and develop tools uh, to help a person who uh, was depressed or had an anxiety problem, uh, taking medica medication or therapy, and say, now you know, I want to think about wellness. So this is a, a good program uh, to uh, want to enhance wellness. Now, during uh, depression, it could also be useful uh, with one's uh, physician or therapist to, to uh, uh, consider accessing some of the tools because the tools that are in the intrinsic practice are derived from psychology, neuroscience, psychiatry, uh, uh, such as cognitive uh, tools or emotional tools and so on. So they can also uh, be used as tools in themselves in the context of a uh, toolkit. But otherwise, if uh, one is interested in uh, just uh, a wellness program uh, or psychological uh, uh, literacy program, so it's a program online, as I said, free, that has been organized around six steps to get better. Uh, or to get to, to get enhance one's uh, experience of wellness or of happiness, uh, it is uh, a like uh, a course with homework and with uh, tools uh, that can can be used and uh, templates. But it's around six steps. So the first step is how to have a wellness practice for oneself. You know, how to do that. The second one is how to define what happiness be for oneself. Because if one wants to be able to be happier, better in life is to have a notion of what do they think happiness is? It's not going to be my definition or your definition that can be good for everybody. So that's step number two. Number three is about self-knowledge. Like we said earlier, self-knowledge at the body level, the emotions, the thoughts, the concepts, and so on. Seven dimensions to uh, know oneself uh, better. Step four is knowing the world we live in, in a sense that can be useful to understanding uh, how the world can contribute to happiness. Step five is how to uh, envision a happy life, uh, very concretely, situation to situation. And step six is uh, from our envisioning of how we would like to be in certain situation, have specific techniques uh, for, it could be thought techniques, emotion techniques, uh, visualization, uh, it could be affirmation and so on and so forth, how to get there and be better and better and better in one's uh, experience uh, of life. Thank you so much for sharing the intrinsic practice with us all. This is a self-paced accessible course, right? So anyone can access it whenever they want and however they'd like, essentially. That's right. That's right. So uh, you go on the site, uh, it's free, don't even have to register. So they, it's, it's totally confidential. And you follow follow the various uh, steps, you know, various steps uh, with the, the lessons. 
So it's reading, and it's often a page is not that long, so a few minutes to read. Uh, there are many videos that uh, give uh, explanations and demonstrations on how to use the tool, and they're all less than five minutes. Uh, and who more to do? Who more to do? Because it's like a course in anything. If you want to learn uh, music, you want to learn sports, uh, go to the classes. It can be useful, but a lot of it has to do with uh, practice and uh, homework and, and, and repetition. Uh, so, but so what we find uh, uh, interesting and we're happy about is that it's been uh, uh, there with, with free access. People who uh, uh, go on it more than once, uh, there's a good 30 to 35% of people who go back to the site uh, from uh, 25 to 200 times. So we presume that they find it useful. That's why they go, go back to it. And the uh, age ranges uh, of access to the site uh, are uh, in, uh, the 18 to uh, 24, 24 to 34. Uh, in the majority. Uh, so young people find it, uh, I guess, uh, they find it uh, uh, useful because they go back to it uh, frequently. That's amazing. Perhaps we can do some sort of um, session on Discord, which is discord.gg slash psych to go where we can kind of answer questions that people might have about each step. And we can discuss this further to see how one can really integrate IP into their day-to-day -day life. Yes, yes, and uh, and uh, with concrete examples, for example, of uh, yeah. of how to use the tools uh, and uh, specific experiences. Yeah, that that would be a uh, awesome. good to do. Yeah, fun to do. Yeah. I've left the link to the intrinsic practice. It's the intrinsicpractice.com, but I left the link in the description box, the Instagram, the LinkedIn, also in the live chat box. So if anyone would like, they can definitely visit there. Also, make sure to. Um, Stay well, and thank you so much, Dr. Bradwin, for joining me today to answer these questions that the community has sent about depression. Well, thank you, Monica. Thank you, psych to go and thank you, uh, all of you who uh, have been at this uh, session. That it's uh, very grateful. Thank you very much, and good luck thank to everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you to Cindy. Thank you to the whole psych to go team, and of course, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Together, we can all make psychiatry accessible to all. So have a nice day and make sure to visit the intrinsic practice and all the links in the description box below.